So here is, here's what that uh, beginnings of the military base looked like. Why did, why did the military first come to Magoo? The military first came to Magoo because of the war in the Pacific. So the war in the Pacific was essentially the Japanese kicked our butt and, and took over all this land. And then the plan in World War II was essentially to retake that stuff back. <laughs> Airplanes were not as powerful as we have now. So airplanes couldn't easily go from LA to Tokyo, let's say. So they had to do what was so-called island hopping. So we'd go take over an island and then fortify that island. And one of the key things we would do on those islands, establish a airstrip. So we needed places where we could train, like you got, you know, people like you guys, 18-year-old, 19-year-olds, 17-year-olds coming on in that were gonna be our Naval Seabees is a classic Navy speak. I was just at a meeting yesterday with all these people from the military. Every single thing is an acronym. So Seabees <laughs> started originally as the letter C, the letter B, which was an abbreviation for construction battalion, so the Naval Engineers. And, and, and wonderful, through the looking glass, now we call them the Seabees, S-E-A-B-E-E. -E -E. So the acronym has come to be a mascot and it's gotten crazy. So, anyway, but it's, so CBs originally stood for Construction Battalion, Naval Engineers. These are the guys who are gonna follow right after the troops, or sometimes they were the troops, and then go and put in um, rapidly deployable landing strips. A lot of times that's these, essentially these metal grates that they would come out, lay them down. Now, what, what's, what's the South Pacific? A lot of sandy beaches. They needed a place with a lot of broad sandy beaches. So Magoo is a perfect spot. They could come and they could have these recruits do a two or three week training and teach them how to put down these landing strips on what amounted to Sandy Beach. Show them how to connect everything, how to make it safe, how to level it, how to do this and that. And then when they were done, they rip it up and they send them off to war and they bring another crew in. So this is a very important training area, primarily because it was flat, you know, wetlandy, sandy beach area. So, so that's what Magoo originally was in terms of the military's context. Towards the end of the, of the war, they said, well, this is actually a really valuable chunk of land. We're just going to keep it, essentially. Uh, we originally had an, air, had an airfield here, Army Airfield, which then became Air Force. Um, that was what we now call Camarillo Airport. That was the original military airstrip. And then when we, when we took over the base formally, we did a huge amount of dredging and filling, more on that in a second. And, and essentially filled in a bunch of the wetland to make it high and compact it to make it a landing ship. So then the military presence migrated from Camarillo to the, um, to the coast, and then Camarillo was converted to a civilian uh, airstrip, which is why it's such a huge complex. That's why the county is used, uh, our airport, for everything. We have our animal shelter there. We have high schools there because it was this huge complex, originally a military complex. Um, so it's much larger than a typical, quote unquote, small municipal airport. Okay, now, let me say the other key important thing about this, very important for you guys to understand. Um, I think a lot of times people look at military base and they say, bastards. <laughs> they say, you guys are destroying things, you guys are killing things. Of course the military folks blow stuff up, of course they shoot stuff. But in our world, many of the Department of Defense land holdings are incredibly important. Why? Well, one, check out, here's the Oxnard Plain, classic example. If we had not, I posit, that if we had not put in this military base, there would be no wetland there, or virtually no wetland. This land grab, this spreading of, of taking over agriculture, would have gone right up to the ocean there. The military have things called fences. The military have things called guard dogs. The military have dudes with guns that'll shoot you if you come on base. So that's, that's an unusual thing to have protecting your wetland, right? We normally don't have that level of protection. To be sure, as we'll, as we'll learn, there, there were transformations and degradations and impacts of the military. But nevertheless, the reason we have whatever we do have that remains is only because of the military. When I did my PhD at UCLA, 
um, I mean, I worked underwater on scuba and stuff, but, but my colleagues in the biology department that did, that worked on, on land and terrestrial systems, a huge proportion, I would say probably 65, something like that, 65, 70% of them that did their work, did their work on Department of Defense land holdings. If you guys come with us to New Orleans, my colleague, John Lambrinos, who's now at Oregon State, his whole PhD was on Vandenberg Air Force Base. Many of these Department of Defense lands, they don't want to nuke. Well, I mean, there's areas where we actually literally nuke them, but, but, but most places we don't, right? Because it's training grounds for these guys. Camp Pendleton, the value of Pendleton isn't that we turn it into a city. The value of the Pendleton Marine Base is that it's, it's, there's arroyos and there's hills and there's this and that. And so guys can actually practice you know, land warfare and stuff like that in an area that is natural, right? So again, they're, they're, they do mess with things, and I'm not trying to say they're perfect, but, but um, the DOD hold a huge amount of land in the US and in our territories, and they've become important refuges for many species of concern, et cetera. And that's, that's certainly the case here at Magoo. Next theme, let's talk about water movement, right? We, the first thing we gotta get right when we're doing our restoration when it, comes to re, when it comes to wetlands is make sure we get our hydrology right. Let's talk about the hydrology of this system. We first start to channelize Cayugas Creek, the main freshwater input here, and one of only three year-round coastal, you know, large coastal rivers that go into the ocean in Ventura County. One Ventura River, two Santa Clara River, three Cayugas Creek. Um, the area right up around the 101, that area is first channelized in 1884. So let me tell you about channelization of, of rivers or waterways. So what, what do we mean by that? Uh, it could mean cementing, it could mean putting rocks, but, right, but, but hardening, right? hardening the banks. So instead of the banks eroding right, left, doing the, the sinuosity, whatever it wants to do, we fix it in place. So that's great if we have something valuable or our house or something right next to it, because that means the creek bank isn't gonna erode into our house, right? Or, or, or might, might not migrate into our farm field or whatever it is. <coughs> but what is that, what else is that? Is there any downsides of channelizing? Doesn't it make the flow a lot faster? Yeah, so, so by constraining the flow, usually all times you put some walls up to you know, a little bit higher, so we contain the flow within this bounded area, it's, it's gonna, that same amount of water needs to pass by there, so the flows will oftentimes speed up. So you'll, you'll oftentimes then start to get erosion uh, of the other areas. So these other areas are getting eroded, so what are they gonna do? They're gonna channelize the area area. And then the guys downstream of them, the, and or floodwaters are gonna, and so the floodwaters that would normally spill out into your floodplain, that are now contained within the channel, can't go in the floodplain, so they're gonna go into the, the people below you's floodplain, let's say, or maybe above you depending on the hydrology of the system. So then therefore, those guys are getting flooded. Well, this sucks, I'm gonna put in my own flow. So it, it leads to this, this ca almost always leads to this cascading of once you start channelizing the area, then your neighbor's gonna do it, and then their neighbor's gonna do it, and then their, so usually when you nucleate fixing the channel, it often metastasizes up and down the stream area. And that's what we saw here. So it starts in 80, 1884, and then we just see it spread all around, uh, up and down the uh, Cayugas Creek. Um, in fact, we have a student, we had a student last semester, we have a student this year doing their capstone essentially on channelization up in Newberry Park. They're looking at a more channelized stream versus a less channelized stream to look at some of those effects. Uh, in 1926, 1927, we, we launched the first drainage districts, or the first, the first big drainage districts that were actually in the Oxnard Plain. So this is area, as I said before, we're bringing all this water onto the plain, we gotta get that water off. These are now linear channels, straight structures. Um, by 1926, the entirety of the lower Cayugas Creek, so basically from, we can call it the 101, down to the ocean, whatever that is, five, six, seven miles, something like that, um, that whole area is channelized, that, that whole, stream area, the banks are all fixed. They can no longer move around wherever it might want to. Within a few years, we've levied the entire Cay Cayugas and especially the area around Magoo. So again, not letting floodwaters spill out wherever the floodwaters want to do, which is what these you know, coastal systems have done for millennia. We don't, we don't like that starting in 1931. 
Um, the Army Corps picks up the, the standard and starts going town around the Oxnard Plain, really starting in the mid-1940s at the end of World War II. Um, and then, as we said before, the base is formally chartered in 1947. 1948, we start to transform the base, primarily by scooping up a bunch of sediment from the wetland. Why? It's wetlands. Wetlands suck, right? Remember that? Wetlands smelly. Who cares about wetlands? No permit needed. You just do it. This is before the Clean Water Act, etc. So we're looking now down at the main part of the Magoo. So to the right will be the um, eastern arm and then Point Magoo. So, uh, uh, and so PCH will be to the right and, and to the north, or to the top and to the right of this photo. We scooped out a huge amount of Magoo, enough sediment to pile on to raise um, the bulk of the base three to four meters. So in some cases, five meters in elevation. Right, so that those houses, those runways are now on dry land. That's a massive amount of sediment that we moved. So huge transformation. That's the places where we're piling the sediment up on the runway, obviously that wetland's destroyed. The area that we're scooping out to get the sediment from, that's no longer a wetland, it's now a, a, a bay, basically, right? One of the places we took a lot, of, a lot of sediment from is this area right here. This is the central basin of Magoo Lagoon. So this is Cayuga's Creek is coming in here, right? Um, originally, so we, we borrowed this for the, for the construction, but then we started making this huge bay. So rich, and so maybe you guys don't realize this, but just off of Magoo is Magoo Canyon, a deep sea canyon. Not as deep as the Monterey Canyon, but it's, but it's pretty good. So initially, one of the uses of this base, submarines. At least it was proposed for that. So they had the Cold War, right? Things are going on, we want to be protected, you know, hiding from the Russians. So the idea is submarines can come up the submarine canyon, enter the mouth of Magoo Lagoon, spin around, do a 360, fuel up, and, and keep going. So nobody, this hasn't officially ever been said, but it sounds like a submarine came in maybe once at most, and they realized this is, this is stupid, this isn't gonna work. But this, this basin, right, was thought initially it could be a submarine turning basin. And it could be a you know, useful part of our coastal defense infrastructure stuff. That clearly, again, if it ever worked at all, it was very short-lived. We have this huge area. Over one El Nino storm, over one three-day period, okay, so, so we don't have good environmental practices going up into this it, into this era, right? People are doing whatever the heck they want. Ventura County, we're very hilly. And so people had a lot of poor sediment management going on. So we had these really, uh, people putting avocado farms right up the mountains, it rains, a bunch of that sediment comes down. Much of that has been solved. Much of that is, is vastly, vastly, vastly improved. But way back when, we had really erodible soils, the, ge the geologists would call it friable soils, we had erodible soils, we had bad sediment management, and so we had big rain events, we get a lot of sediment moving. And so this is insane. So let me ex explain what the, these pictures are showing to you guys. This is from a report from a, a now retired scientist. Uh, um, on the left is 1971, that's looking straight down. The dark is water. The dark is, is you know, the standing water. This is 1977. So it looks, you know, several years difference here, six years, not, not appreciably different, right? A little teeny bit of structure here changing, but really pretty much this big scooped out area that used to be wetland that's no longer wetland. Over this one three-day El Nino storm, we went from at high tide being, or typical high tide, routine high tide, uh, being, um, two parts mud flat to, excuse me, being two parts open water to one part mud flat to the inverse, mm -hmm. being two parts mud flat to one part water. An insane volume of sediment came, came down. So check it out. In the wake after it, look, boom, this happened. Now here is, it's different, 
illumination. So here the water is dark. Here the water is this light covered. It's reflecting the light with the angle that they, this was taken. But look, here's the water. Here's the thing. So this is all now new land or new sediment, right? Uh, dumped so much that it's emerging. Same thing here. Same thing uh, all around this fringe. So, and then a couple years later, by 1983, look at the, all, here's the standing water now. This is all totally sedimented in. So this, so this is sedimented in, and this is low. Now this is all emergent marsh. So huge sediment dynamics. So much so that original, that, well, we just did a study last year. When did we publish that? I don't know, two years ago, whatever, to the Regional Water Quality Control Board, where the Cayuga's Creek was technically an impaired waterway um, by water quality standards by sediment. And so everybody was worried because this idiot from the Army Corps did this stupid ass study 20 years ago and basically back at the envelope calculation and said, oh my God, Magoo Lagoon sedimenting in. It's gonna, there's not gonna be any wetlands. It's gonna be too much sediment. Dude was totally high. Bad data, bad assumptions. Um, when we re-sampled this area, um, long story short is it's about in balance with our systems, with our, with our, our sediment systems. So in other words, there's sediment coming into the system, there's sediment being lost, it's, it's roughly equal. We are not about to clog up Magoo with sediment despite what some people would have you believe and despite what some political actors would have you believe that would like to use that sediment for, for purposes of beach nourishment and other things. So, so huge sediment dynamics. So things are relatively stable now, but realize, we, look what we did. We scooped out the whole of that wetland and then all this new sediment came on in. That is crazy. That's an amazing amount of change in this coastal system. All within the last, all within my lifetime, all within a, 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 you know, the last couple decades. Another three theme of this area, recreation. Incre again, starting low, getting more and more. So Ventura County Game Preserve, Point Mag Magu, legally in the document spelled with an A, Point Magu Game Preserve. Remember we saw those photos before? These are two duck hunting clubs privately held, one of which is supposedly held by about six families, all of which multi-billionaires, and they don't want to sell that land to us or anything like that, right? So, so that entered, entered um, uh, the, those private land holdings starting you know, over a century ago. But then we had a very popular fish camp. People come from all around to go fishing out here. They um, uh, incorporated in 1923, right, and they had a pier right after, or very close in the wake of that, a hurricane came up, destroyed the pier. So we lost the fishing pier. A hurricane came up to Ventura County, right? So in this era of climate change, this era of climate change, where we're used to hurricanes hitting Baja, northern Baja, um, they do come to, up to us. In this era of climate change, we're going to get more of them. So again, this thinking that we're just using the last couple decades as our model, incorrect. History gives us a better perspective, a better contextualization of what's going on. And then, huge heyday in the 1920s, silent film era, massive numbers of films were filmed at Magoo. And so here's some examples of that. So on the left is, is Magoo, a big silent film being filmed, right? They could bring in palm trees, make it look like the South Pacific, they could do whatever. Very, very popular uh, filming location. On the right, is um, the title of this w was uh, uh, a regular Saturday catch at the Magoo Fish Pier. Oh <laughs> That's a what we now call giant sea bass. That is an endangered fish. They're recovering, but um, but we did, have been doing our best to try to drive them extinct for several decades. <laughs> so um, this is uh, you know a lady in her in her weekend dress going out there and bringing in this hundreds of pounds fish, right? Very productive system. Lots of kelp, all this kind of good stuff going on here. The system is very different. So now this fish would not have been in our salt marsh, but it absolutely would have been part of the, the tissue of connected ecosystems um, that would be supplying larvae for other species and stuff like that into our system and our system would supply things into. So again, radically changed. Lots of people. Look how many people on the beach there, right? In the 1920s. Look how many. We well, can't tell them this, but the pier packed every weekend with people 
fishing, fishing, fishing. So huge fishing pressure, recreational fishing pressure, but also lots of recreational opportunities. The naval base changed that in that we, at least for the Magoo part, not for the Orman part, but the Magoo part because they restrict access. But the base is huge. There's sometimes now 20,000 people on base, so there's a lot of people there, um, even though the general public might not be able to recreate there. And, uh, and then the next era we see is this wave of development, uh, development pressure. Now the Magoo Lagoon proper that's in the Navy base is, is I mean, it was, it was obviously developed and impacted in the 40s and 50s, but outside the area around Ormond, Ormond Beach, just up the coast from that, in fact, you know, Ormond touches Magoo. We, we, we use the names because, the, because um, that's where the legal, uh, where the fence line is. So we call them different places, but really that's why I say the complex, because they're one contiguous system. So just over the fence, lots of pressure to develop. So for example, here is a plan from about 1981 that was to, you know, let's put a giant high-end hotel at the beach, including things like a pool at the beach. Uh, I've never quite understood that. <laughs> um, but whatever, there's, there's those kinds of developmental pressures. Um, okay, so yeah, so we're still talking about this whole issue of, you know, is there a problem? What's the context? All of this information goes into our thinking about what's going on. Some of the efforts that we're doing right now to monitor, and these are some of the things you could do for your site, would be to first just what's there, right? I just mentioned we just finally got permission after a long time of asking, after five years of asking, to start flying our drones to do mapping of our site, uh, of, the, of Magoo. Um, this is something we did with our colleagues from um, um, Cal State Monterey Bay. And this is actually what my coastal marine management class did. We did this in 2012. So the students went out and helped us with this. This is called the kelp fly, that thing on the left. It's a modified uh, wave runner that has some bathymetry stuff attached to it. And essentially we could drive over the bottom and paint, which is what we've done here, and paint and look at, look at what the shape of the, of the bottom of the lagoon looks like. This is, a, this is a, a more complete map. This is from the Santa Clara estuary that we've also mapped, that we're also working on restoring. So this is, again, the same thing. And that maybe is a little hard to see. So here's, here's what may be a little bit clearer for you guys, but, but the idea is now we can look at flows and things like that, and we can see what the channel is like by doing this type of mapping. So, so that's one of the things, is we're starting to look at our modern era. Hey, what's there? What's the shape of things? What are the critters that are there? Um, oh yeah, so the last thing I'll say is watch out for pretty pictures, because people love to fly a drone, people love to drive, drive a kelp fly like this, and then make a map and go, yeah, <laughs> see? And like, yeah, it's a map, like, so what? So that gives you some insight, but sometimes people think that's the, the, the golden ring, and that's not the golden ring, that's just the start of the process. Um, we have a, a wonderful study that was published a couple years ago. I, I don't have you guys read the whole thing, but I would encourage you guys to go look at it. Santa Clara River Historical Ecological Study. Um, this is uh, one image from that. <laughs> This is one image from that. This is show, okay, so again, so now Magoo is the lower right hand side of this image. Those different gray dotted lines are different historical tracks of the Santa Clara River. I'll just say that again. So Magoo Lagoon is right here. The Santa Clara River used to end at Magoo. Sometimes it ended in Ventura. So the Santa Clara River is such a massive river, it's migrated across the entirety of the Oxnard Plain over the last several thousands of years, right? So we think about, again, because it's channelized, we think about it being the, in its current location, that is but its most recent residency. So these systems, very dynamic, moving all around. So this is um, oh, two great ladies, but the one I want to talk about on the uh, right 
um, has unfortunately no longer with us, Jean Harris. When I first came to campus, she was one of the first people that welcomed me here. Wonderful lady. I'm proud to say we now house her archives in our library. So wonderful, if you guys are interested in, in environmental movements and this and that, she, great lady. So I came down, she was a school teacher. Jean Harris was a school teacher uh, here in Oxnard. Very civic minded, very, very community oriented lady. And uh, long story short, she, she said, hey, how come we don't have, um, you know, she loved Ormond Beach, she loved the wetlands, she loved the beach, how come this isn't protected? So she and uh, Roma and her, her friend basically got going an entity that's now known as the Ormond Beach Task Force to advocate for protection, to advocate for conserving and restoration of this resource. I started this in the late 70s. This was a long, long battle. And we find with many of our coastal wetland, many of our, our, our environmental projects in general, the most successful ones start at the grassroots. They start with people that aren't rich. They start with people that aren't powerful. They start with people that aren't connected. But it's constant. Every year, at chugging in, chugging out, doing the hard work of building constituencies, building momentum to have these actions taken. And Jean Harris, absolutely one of our heroes. Um, so um, I was busy starting up this program and all this and that, and I was, I was doing various things. So by the time I finally started to get, have some time on my hands, she unfortunately was in a retirement home, a rest home in Ventura. So I decided I'm gonna start doing a project where I record her oral history. We started talking about it. We did the first one, and then I'm very sad to say she passed away right after about a week, or a couple weeks after, a week or so after I took this photo. So I have the very first one, <laughs> the very first interview, but we have all the rest of her records. And um, this is one of the types of insights that you can glean when you talk to folks. So here's a quote from Jean. So she said, Roy Lockwood, um, who was, was dead by the time I came back down to Southern California. Roy Lockwood has been deceased now for a long, long time. But when I met him in the 70s, he would tell me all about the fishing camps they used to have out there. How when he was a young boy in like the 1910s, 1920s, at high tide, he could pull his boat from Magoo Rock all the way to where the current location of Wainimi Pier is today. Can you imagine? It must have been wonderful. So what we're talking about is, here's that photo again, that you could go, not necessarily a solid lagoon, but you could go down coastal waterways at high tide from Magoo Rock all the way to the Wainimi Pier. Very different from now. So very different hydrology from now, right? Very different from now. Challenges, let's talk about Ormond challenges. The challenges now, so obviously the military base is there. That, that's not radically changing anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Ormond, we're in the process, uh, we just had another meeting earlier this week of our, our restoration advisory group, working on the design of, of this project. Um, so here's one of the constraints. One of the constraints we have at this site is this Halico site. This is a picture in 2002, we're at the ocean looking inland, and so Magoo is going to be to the right. Uh, and what you see is this thing here, this big industrial complex, and then, and then here's this, this drainage, and then here is this big gray pile. That gray pile <laughs> is a slag pile. That gray pile is the refuse pile. This thing is a recycling, the thing on the left is a recycling center. So they're taking metal, all kinds of stuff, industrial waste, whatever, they're recycling it. Now we think of that, awesome, recycler, that's great, we like recyclers, right? These guys weren't maybe the best stewards of the environment. So whenever you recycle stuff, especially big, large scale industrial machinery, chunks like that, I think you, I think you guys have the impression that we take our aluminum can, we melt our aluminum can down, it's recycled. Sometimes it's like that, a lot of times it's not. There's other impurities, there's other things that we need to pull out of the mix. And so that's what you're seeing on the right. That's what this gray pile is. This is essentially the stuff that they couldn't, couldn't uh, uh, you know, turn into some other useful product. So it's being piled there. Why is Halico there in this wetland? Or why, why do they choose to locate there, you guys think? Was it something before the recycling? Uh, no, before the recycling, uh, to my knowledge, no. It, there wasn't anything there. It was, it was just wetland before. There was no other development there. Was it, was it, was it, 
Cheap land, right? Wetlands stink, smell bad. They're cheap land, good. What else? It was away from the urban center. There actually are a lot of apartments right next to it. Cheap apartments. We have a lot of um, immigrant labor in our, in our county. Maybe not everybody is, is legally documented and stuff. So we have a lot of apartments over here where a lot of, you know, lots of people living in there, a couple families, a whole big family. A lot of folks, a lot of folks maybe don't speak English. Think if they see something going on, they're gonna call the cops? Hell no, hell no. So you have a disenfranchised population that's not gonna be ratting on you for sound ordinance, for, 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 for emission ordinances, stuff like that, right? So you have a compliant population, right? You can kind of do what you want, right? They're not gonna complain. You can make all the noise you want at night. You can make all the smells you want. They're, 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 you're not gonna get any complaints. It's in a wetland, right? Stinky, smelly, unvalued place. So it's a perfect place for this type of operation, right? Cheap land, great. A lot of times we have our environmental problems and we look at them now and we go, oh my gosh, how could these guys have possibly done this? And in truth, a lot of times people didn't know they were doing something wrong. DDT was a, was a miracle substance people thought. Didn't hurt you, only hurt the insects that are causing disease, that kind of stuff. So it's very important you guys don't get too judgy with the past at times. But sometimes it's okay to be judgy. In the case of Halico, <laughs> these people are going to hell. <laughs> and I don't say that lightly. Wow. These people knew exactly what they were doing. This was not a case of doing something that we then, then the laws change, then the understanding changes. These guys knew exactly what they were doing. What I'm showing you here is a Supreme Court ruling, California Supreme Court from the 70s, saying they need to do stuff differently, saying their emission practices, their this and that is messed up. These guys didn't care. They just kept doing it. There are reports from Gene and these folks that when they were going and trying to take samples of the wetland over here in the 70s, the guards would go up here and shoot at them. Now, I doubt they were trying to kill them, but clearly the idea was stay away, right? That's not the action of folks that are trying to be good community stewards. This was a family owned business, privately held business. They divested. So when I, when I, when I came here to start our ESRM program, this was still an active plant. This was still recycling. As far as I know, they, the family still owns a plant in Tennessee. They, di they changed the structure of the, co the corporation so that they were not liable. So they made all their money and they got out. And then the company went bankrupt. So who deals with that? You, Merry Christmas, you get to do that, right? Again, not the actions of a good corporate citizen, not the action of a good member of our community that suddenly sees a problem and tries to deal with it. They squeezed every single ounce of money they could out of that and then left. And left you holding the bag. So what we have is, now this is, so now we're in the marsh looking, looking up coast, looking towards Oxnard, looking towards Ventura. And you can see this thing looks like, if you guys haven't been out there, it looks like a mountain. A mountain of mostly heavy metal waste. Now the company's gone. Now we're starting to have people go in and tag up the abandoned factory, rip out copper, all this and that. Huge nightmare. So not, not only is it a, is a danger in terms of the environment, now it's becoming an attractive nuisance. People are going doing drugs in there. It's getting really sketch. Right? So uh, we hit upon uh, a former uh, state employee who was a great advocate for Ormond Beach Peter Brand hit upon this thing. The EPA has this strike force, which I didn't know about, nobody really knew about before. So chemical plant tonight blows up in LA. Uh, the pipeline that just blew up in, um, in Alabama. What are you gonna do, right? In certain industries, like the oil industry, maybe that was a bad example, they, there's, they plan for that. But in general, chemical plants, this and that, you don't necessarily have a robust 
response infrastructure. The EPA has a response infrastructure that we pay for, you pay for. They have guys on retainer, they have consulting firms on retainer that can be ready to go on very short notice to come on in and deal with that toxic dump site, whatever this or that. Normally, all they do is train, because we don't, thankfully we don't have chemical plants blowing up every week. So we actually hit upon this EPA strike team and said, hey, we got this site that we think is toxic. Can you guys come in? Well, come on in. So <laughs> thankfully, they ended up coming in. They stayed for six months to deal with this. And this wasn't dealt with. This was just stabilization. So what they did was they did our first assessments where they went around, sampled this stuff, and like, oh my god, it's these toxins, right? Uh, again, primarily heavy metals is what we're talking about. Um, and they went and they recontoured that pile. So they, they, they laid it, they made the slope be more gentle. They took jute netting, stabilizing cloth, and they covered the sides. So when it rains, we'd have less stuff dribbling off the, off the uh, you know, sides into the, into the waterways and stuff. Um, did a bunch of sampling, found three small areas. This is what gets, gets all the media attention. Very, very small, smaller than this room, each one, where we had an alpha source, which means radiation. So some of the stuff they recycled was also, was also were also nuclear reactors. They had contracts of like medical reactors and stuff. So again, that's very small. That's very small. There's no danger to you guys, and we scooped all that stuff out. So, but the point is, they did the first assessment. So rapid assessment, five million bucks. It was awesome, and really jump started the process to get this listed as a Superfund site, which is the federal list of toxic sites that have essentially been abandoned that are still posing a threat to the environment or communities that we need to clean up. So we're on that list now. It can be decades and decades of waiting. Rough ballpark, who knows exactly, but, but hard to get a good number, but rough ballpark, last time we estimated this, we're probably talking 60 to $70 million just to scoop all this stuff up and take it to a responsible toxic dump site, a holding site. That's not to restore it, that's just to clean up this site. So that's one of the constraints we have here. Another constraint that we have is this. So now if we just go a little bit farther up coast, we have, oh, it looks really blurry, sorry. I don't know why that looks so bad. Got to get a new photo in there, sorry. Um, this is uh, the a power plant that's there. So just like we talked about up at Elkhorn Slough, we have power plants, power plants here. So same thing, want to be close to water, all that stuff. Um, uh, so we have a power plant in the middle of our wetland. In theory, this is a peaker plant. Does anybody know about what peaker plants are? Yeah. What is it? They only function over like peak loads of energy or so over the summer or the winter. Right. They're not meant to be functioning year round or not designed to function year round. It's rather kick in for a few days, a few weeks. And for us in Southern California, that primarily means when we're, it's hot summer and people need their air conditioners going. So midday, right? When we, and, and so historically, these peaker plants have had lower environmental standards because the idea is not running year round. You don't need to be as, as super clean, but that's changing. So we're in the midst of a debate. It's unclear what's going to happen. But these plants essentially have to have a higher level of, of scrubbing and cleaning of their emissions, and the operators don't necessarily want to do that. So we're, we're, there's a bit of a, it's being sussed out right now. But the point is, huge power plant. This was put in originally with rail lines, railroad tracks to bring in uh, you know, fuel barrels and stuff like that. Now there's actually a, a natural gas pipeline. So it's natural gas fired. And so now the fuel comes in you know, essentially continu continuously. Um, all of our peaker plants have been operating much more than they historically have because um, starting about four years ago, we had the problem with um, um, San Onofre. The nuclear generating station shut down, and now it's officially shut down forever. So that has caused huge stresses on our, our energy grid. We lost the uh, large Aliso Canyon natural gas storage facility last year. And so, so when we have all these assault, uh, strains, the peaker plants tend to get flicked on more. So, so this one is, is operating uh, quite a lot these days. Again, we talked about this pressure to develop, all these ideas, let's put in more condos, let's put in more development on the coast. We have a lot of sensitive species in these, on these, in these um, areas, including things like uh, Cor uh, Corlanthus salt, salt marsh bird's beak, the heme parasitic plant that's over there on the left. Things like this spiny rush, which is this guy right here. This guy right here, which is, um, which is a, uh, not endangered, but, but species of concern, a really important plant. 
We have things like Tidewater gobies, this endangered fish in the lower left that's in the, um, primarily their population of Magoo is near the, um, near the uh, PCH bridge. Uh, we have things like terns and snowy plovers, all that kind of stuff. So we have a lot of species of concern. Um, here is an image from one of uh, your former students that used to work out here. So check it out. Here's some nests in 2008. The red are least tern nests. The green are western snowy plover nests. And what's, what pattern do you see? It's not where the parents are. Yeah, not here. Why, why might they not be here? It's not groomed. Good guess, but it's not groomed. Lights. Power plant used to always have its lights on. And so apparently there's this light effect where, I mean, there's probably other things going on too, but, but we did an experiment where we turned off the lights for a while and we actually got more nesting there. So this appears to be, this appears to be a disturbance phenomenon. Um, so we have that going on. Then we have these little green tent things, which were homeless houses. So this has largely gone away thanks to a, several years of work, but at least for many years, these were homeless encampments, right? And obviously people are down their luck, need a place to live. It's illegal, it was illegal for us to go and knock those down, even though it's illegal for them to be there. <laughs> so we would have to go and put a, a notice on these things, serve a notice, just like the sheriff would give an eviction notice if you guys weren't paying your rent, and then come back three days later and then could knock it down. And check it out. It's not made with concrete. It's made with driftwood. So when these wood, we would knock these down, within hours, they would be re, rebuilt or built just a few feet away or whatever. Again, um, not that we want to necessarily harass people that are having a tough time, but this is in an endangered species habitat, right? So probably not too good. The endangered species can look like this. Very cute. Hard to see. These guys' behavior is to not move. These guys have been predated. These guys are having problems. But, but, um, but right, these guys, uh, their, their modus operandi is to freeze and not move when, when folks come around so that they, they can get crushed if we're driving a truck on the car, on the, on the road, uh, excuse me, on the beach, or if a dog is coming by, whatever. So, so very sensitive species, a challenging situation. They nest both in the, on the beach and dune complex, but also into Magoo we have this challenge of water level. So you see that here. This is, this is um, our existing parcels, which have been pulled together from a couple different owners. This is Ormond. This is Magoo. This is the Navy base. So we're just talking about the non-military non base areas. So here's Magoo. Here's Ormond. This is showing us elevations, right? So the, the hotter the color, the higher the elevation. The, the uh, cooler the color, the greener the color, the lower. And then blue is currently subtitle levels. So a lot of this doesn't look too good. When we add on climate change, it's going to look even worse, as we've done with some modeling efforts with the Nature Conservancy. So this area wants to be a wetland. It really wants to be a wetland. It doesn't want to be a sod farm. It doesn't want to be light industry, as one of the owners would very much like it to be classified, primarily because then when he eventually has to sell it to the state, if it's, light, if it's zoned light industry, he gets more dollars per square foot. But um, lots of challenges. Here is the current makeup of, again, this is, so this is the naval base, Point Magoo Naval Air Weapons Station. N now part of what's considered naval base Ventura County. This is the Magoo unit. Um, here's that one of those duck hunting clubs. Here's another duck hunting club. Here is privately held land. This is not owned by anybody other than, than the uh, owner. But this is growing sod. Great. Um, uh, so this parcel is owned by the state now, California Coastal Conservancy. This stretch is owned by the city of Oxnard. This wetland complex area here is owned by the Nature Conservancy. This is um, the essentially abandoned land of this, of this company, which is in bankruptcy. A company bought it from them insanely. I didn't tell you that story. These guys that I don't understand what the hell they were thinking development company called Bluebird, they came and bought it. They thought they could spend a few million dollars cap it and then put all these high-end houses on it. Oh my God. And they came to us and we said, I said, dude, you're high. Like that, that's not gonna work, man. It's all, you're camping on heavy metals. No, 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 we think we can do it. And surprise, surprise, they uh, 
walked away from it and decided they couldn't make any money. So you see we have these parcels and so we're in the planning process now of trying to link these up and figure out what to do. But check it out again, constraint here of this power plant, big problem. Constraint here of the Halico Superfund site. Hydrologically, this is the low point. This is hydrologically where water draining from this area of the basin wants to go and go out to the ocean right through the power plant. I mean, right, excuse me, right through the, um, the uh, Halico site. And then over here is another low spot, which is probably why they put the power plant there. And so we have these constraints. Then we have the military base over here. So if we want to get surface water, say from Cayugas Creek, which is way over here, it has to come through all these, these areas, go through a bunch of culverts underneath the runway, et cetera, culvert, 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 and then get over to here. So we're in the, we're in the midst of trying to figure out how, what to do, how we can do this. And, and there will be a public input phase at some point soon. You guys can provide your input. For planning purposes, we typically talk about these different units. Again, just for clarity, this is privately held. We would like to purchase this. But as of this point, we, the owner is unwilling to sell. So this is only for conceptual planning purposes. I'm not trying to say that the state or anyone else owns this land. But clearly, we all know that we would like to have this be a contiguous wetland area. Again, we'd like to have these areas too. But these are also privately held areas. The state, these are not under public control or nonprofit control. So here's just to give you guys a sense. Um, this is an old active, this is an old round of planning we did several years ago. So we're doing something different now, but just to give you a sense for what's possible, what do you want the wetlands to be? This is an interesting case because unlike some of the things we've been talking about, uh, this is not so-called mitigation. We didn't widen a freeway, destroy 20 acres of wetland, and then need to make 20 acres per se. The impacts here have been impacts for a long time. So, we're, so that's great in the sense that we can make whatever kind of wetlands we want, a freshwater wetland, a saltwater wetland, whatever. The downside is we can make whatever we want. <laughs> so the guys that like salt pans, we should have a lot of salt pans. The people that like fish habitat, we should have a lot of water. The guys that like endangered plants, we should have a lot of plant space, right? So, so it's, it's, a, it's a big debate. So what I'm going to show you, just, we'll just walk through really quickly some of the potential conceptual approaches. Some of them are going to include taking this freshwater source, connecting it to the ocean to have a, sea, a surface seawater connection. Others are going to say, no, like this one here. We're just going to allow groundwater to seep up and sort of burble up through the ground to be the water supply, et cetera. So we have different habitats here mapped out. So this is coastal prairie, so coastal grassland, this color, this color here. This is intertidal, unvegetated. This is what we call this basically... Um, well, actually, it looks like this one. Beach, right? So that's flecked. So this would be sandy beach. So we have a mix of fresh water primarily, brackish, standing water, whatever. So here we go. Have a look. So all the planning purposes, all the planning versions we did before were with these constraints included. And then if we magically snapped our fingers and somehow made those go away, what we would do if we didn't have those constraints. So here's an example of the surface water thing. If we if we magically didn't have the Halico pile or the um, or the power plant. Um, here's a similar, similar features of stuff if we just have those constraints still in place. Here is one where we have um, just a very little temporary seasonal tidal connection there if we didn't have any of the constraints. And here's one if we had, if like the, one of the cheaper ones, we just have a lot of this coastal prairie and, and, and back dune and stuff and don't have a lot of major wetland there. Here's that same thing if we had the constraints. Etc. So one of the neat things about Ormond is it's so far it's the only large-scale wetland restoration that we're planning that are on the books that can specifically deal with sea level rise. Everywhere else is constrained, most typically by PCH or development, that we can't just have a wetland go for a while inland. Here we have agricultural land that if we do nothing is going to go subtidal, right? So not that we're trying to necessarily screw over the the uh, you know, farmers or whatever, but the writing is on the wall. And so we have the ability here to have this restoration go inland, to do it in such a way that it can evolve and adapt with um, sea level rise. And we can still maintain our wetland and not drive the wetland to a bathtub ring around the little teeny edge 
um, of the parking lot or the Walmart store or the, or the freeway or whatever it is. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we're going to finish up today. Questions? Questions about that? So that's a little bit of context about Magoo and Orman. Next, I want to just finish up talking really briefly about some approaches to reference conditions. So that was a bit of the history of the site. Now let's talk about how do we measure things that we might want to use as guidance in our restoration efforts. And the next time we'll hear about some of our restorations that we've done out there. So these are always, um, I would normally do an exercise where I ask you guys to write this out, but we're almost out of time, so I just want to go through this quick. So there are four main ways we can get the reference condition. We could do an a priori guess, meaning not knowing anything else. What do we think should be there? Now you can talk to people like me that spend a lot of time in wetlands, and I can say, well, you probably want this and this and this, which might be well informed, but is nevertheless a guess. We can do a slightly more formal version of that, where I turn my words into computer algorithm and we make a quote unquote model, but really that amounts to just a more refined guess. So I, I would lump both those under an a priori estimate of the reference condition. So we don't, we haven't measured anything directly. It's more just, you know, best estimate. The next is to use history, maybe some of that information I've just been giving you, and to say, hey, we want. So, so our reference condition is going to be the quote-unquote pre-disturbance before we put the parking lot in, whatever it looked like, etc. So sometimes people call that the undisturbed condition. A reference condition might be the best that's possible now. When we created, when our state was created, we had grizzly bears right here in the in, in Magoo Lagoon. No grizzly bears now. So is it really realistic to talk about grizzly bears as being a functional part of our ecosystem? Probably not, right? So, so sometimes we use what people might call the realistic estimate or the realistic condition. And then uh, thirdly, best professional judgment. That's usually where we get a bunch of folks like, like say like this size of a room together and they usually give us lunch and we sit around and they ask us. So instead of having my a priori guess, it essentially amounts to a bunch of folks that maybe have worked in the system, maybe have maybe worked in neighboring systems, and we come together and we use a sort of collaborative group process to get input for um, what we think the reference condition is. This will be an example of historical. So here's a, here's a photograph of the area in question. and, and uh, and so here's, we're looking straight down at Ormond. And this is 1945. Here's what it looks like more recently, including now extended all the way down to Magoo. So you can see Magoo here, here's Magoo, here's Ormond. This is the classic thing that's done. So we took those old T-sheets, those old historic maps, and because they included data on at least some extent of the wetland, we've overlaid it on there. Now, through our historic T-sheet project, you guys can actually get much more high resolution photos than, and much more res resolution, but it doesn't matter. This approach is what's used. This is where the wetlands used to be in red. They're not there now. We should make more wetlands there. Okay, this is a useful exercise. It gives us a sense for what things were like. But this would be saying using a historical approach to reference condition, and things would be good if we had wetland where the red is. Make sense? So very easy to do, very compelling, very easy to get the public to buy into this, but you know, is that really what we want to do now? The other thing we can do is actually go out and measure stuff, measure stuff ourselves. In fact, I keep not calling my friend, uh, a colleague of mine back who wants us to do a seed bank study down in, in uh, some wetlands uh, south of us. So if you guys want to help out in a seed bank study, let me know. Um, but I probably have to call them back first to get the money and stuff first. Anyway, um, so this is, this is an image of some just germinating seeds. In this case, this is Atroplex right here. In, um, in a, uh, coming out of the seed bank. So one of the things we like to use in our lab are seed banks. We think they're a really useful thing to help us figure out what the reference conditions are. So we go and take a core, a soup can, it's very high tech, soup can, boom, into the salt marsh. 
Take that soup can, boom, put it in a four by four inch potting soil pot and put it in our greenhouse next to Modoc. Water it. We use the plants that germinate over the ensuing few weeks as a measure of the seeds in the seed bank. So we count the number of, of plants that come up, say what species they are, etc. And so for example, what you're seeing here is the fact that you, I would say you don't need statistics for this. So here are here is the area from the rack line where where debris accumulates because of hydrological deposition. Check it out. Oh my god, there's a bunch of grass. You don't even know what the species are. A bunch of grass though, some red looking things, some spiky things. Ooh, lots of stuff there. Come a little bit lower? Not so much. There's still some. Come even lower? Virtually nothing. Here's what that looks like in the context of one of our restorations. Now this map will be confusing because we haven't talked about this yet. That's what we'll talk about uh, next time. Um, but we're looking straight down on one of my restorations. And this is a tidal creek that we built. This blue thing is a tidal creek. And this is, a, is low, sloping to high, low, sloping to high. And I've gone in and I've sampled uh, wherever there's a pink dot. And this is, uh, this, is before, this is before I used GIS. This is just using statistics here. And so what we're showing is, the, uh, in this case, this is the density of wetland seeds. And so this is the highest concentration here. Then as we go away, it gets lower and lower and lower and lower. And this is per meter squared. And so what you see is um, uh, close by the lowest elevation, not so exciting. The higher elevation is where most of the action is but also the back of the channel. So that tells us something about the, the functioning of the system. More on that later. Um, we can do a similar thing. In this case, this is, a, this is a, uh, one of our capstone students' projects from a few years ago. This is, this is a, a section of Ormond Beach that is closest to the um, Halico pile. So, so the Halico is over here to the right, actually. And so these guys have gone out and they've mapped um, the current condition of what's there. And they've gone through and through a series of the red dots are sampling um, seeds and sampling um, a sediment. They've mapped out what they think could be um, a restoration plan. So you can use these, these samples of the environment to both tell you what's there now and also help guide you as to what's potentially feasible or what can you emphasize to help with the restoration. In this case, you, we could use seed banks to help tell us about um, the dynamics and goings on of a system. In this case, we're looking at seeds. And these are a bunch of different, so here's Southern California sites. I should have, sorry, I should have graphed this opposite to this. So this is, this is basically, we typically, so this is south to north. This is Willapa Bay up in um, Washington State. This is San Francisco Bay area. Uh, Elkhorn is one of those sites that I just was showing you, we, the historic, historic map. Orange is a restoration site. Green is a reference site. And the, the different symbols just mean we sampled it in different years. But but point is, uh, check it out. What pattern do you see? What pattern do you see in terms of the proportion of the seeds in the seed bank that are non-native? Uh, so these are sampled in different points in time, but let's just ignore the, the time component for now. Let's just treat those as replicates. So, what was the what was the comment there? These points have more invasive species. Yes. Uh, uh, so, for example, these sites had re, have re, on they they have about let's see ten percent or so of the seeds that germinated were non-native, up to sixty odd percent, right? Here's this reference site, which is Biona, which is the highest one. In fact, a lot of Biona when we sample Biona, it's hundred percent. The, uh, sometimes I've sampled there and not got a single native from there. So heavily, so this is telling us that this wetland is really effed up, <laughs> right? This wetland is not producing a lot of native seeds that could repopulate, revegetate uh, a native dominated system. This site here, Palix, also what, one year we sampled it was you know huge. Almost all the seeds were non-native. Here are our restorations. Are our restorations doing a good job? Okay, and this, yeah, so these guys have relatively few numbers of exotics. Few numbers, few numbers. Uh, these periods, though, which are slightly more recently, um, do have a higher proportion than, than these time periods. But then this one has a lot. This is actually before our most recent restoration efforts at, at Malibu. So 
But in any event, um, so we can use data like this to say, hey, is this system, is, how does this system compare to our reference conditions, right? Is it doing better? Is it doing worse? What's a realistic number? Again, should we just say that it should be 0% exotic? Probably not. I mean, that might be ideal. That's what the public might want you to do. But that might be, look at every single, well, uh, let's see, Magoo and one year at China Camp maybe had no exotics. But all the other times, even our really, really kick butt reference sites, you know, they are, almost all have at least a little bit of exotics. So we can use this data to figure out what we should do. Let's remember way back when our old friend, the conceptual picture of restoration. We're going from some point in time, right, to, to a degraded state. And we want to be, here's our reference condition. This is what we want. We want sites that have a distinct level of functioning separate from our degraded, our degraded condition. So for a good metric, one, we have to be able to distinguish orange from green. And then two, ideally sensitive enough that we can look at the, re the recovery trajectory. Even though we might be here this year, we might not be all the way up to the green, we can tell we're, we're on a trajectory to approach functional equivalency. Here you can do that. Here we also use a lot of insect stuff. So here's some insect. Uh, this is an ex experiment we did out at um, Magoo and Ormond a few years ago. So these are sticky traps floating out there and or just sitting out there and they, they stick to insects as they fly by. And the question is, uh, you know, how productive are these systems? And so we do all kinds of stuff. Just like the seed banks, turns out there's optimal places to put these. The optimal place is relatively close to the ground. When we put them close to the ground, we get a bunch of guys. We put them a little bit farther off, we get some guys, but not as many. And then as we go farther and farther up, you get fewer and fewer guys attached. Wait, so this is, this is fly paper. Okay. This is a piece of plastic with a thing called Tanglefoot sprayed on it. So it's just basically super, super sticky stuff. So it turns out that just like seed banks, there's optimal places to look. So rather than doing a thousand seed cores across the whole marsh, you can get most of your data by just focusing on a small sampling effort. Similarly, we could sample insects all up the yin yang everywhere we want, or you could sample really close to the ground. It turns out most insects fly really close to the ground. I didn't know this before I started doing this work because I'm an idiot. I assume because sometimes a bee flies into my face or a mosquito <laughs> flies onto my head that they're everywhere. They are not. Most insects are, are going right close to whatever the, the landscape element is. So if it's, if it's bare linoleum, they're flying mostly right over the linoleum. If there's a chair there, they're going to fly up and over the chair. And so that's what this shows, that you go a few centimeters off the plant, off the ground, off the whatever, and that's where most of the traffic is going to be. So the highest density and highest diversity. So therefore, when we sample these things, that's where we put the, that's where we put the collector. And this is just saying, this is, a, this is a fancy way of saying just what I just told you. This is, this is close to the... Uh, yeah, so this is close to the ground. This is low elevation. This is high off the ground. And so it, the closer we are to the ground, the more diverse we have, the higher density, and we just see that over and over again. Okay, we can also, so we can do measurements like that, which are very detailed, seeds in the seed bank, insects flying around. We can also do another approach, which is, which is, called, um, which is called a rapid assessment methodology. So here's some examples of some of these that we did. These, this is, here's our Halico pile, which is here, here, and, and so we, we have sites we sampled here, we call the Halico site, the Reliance site, Arnold Road site, etc. And we've actually sampled marshes up and down the coast. Uh, before, we, before I talk to you about that last part, let me just say that um, it's important to think about our rationale for sampling these things. Um, we are a practical group. Not everyone is so trained. When we get into the skill sets that you can tell me what all these species are, that's hard. That's a lot of detailed taxonomic training, right? More so than I give you. I give you general taxonomic training in some of our classes. We don't go this deep. This is when I first went up to Stanford. This is a grassland that I was restoring. And I wanted to go sample the insects. So I called up a gentleman from, uh, I won't tell you where, but a, a big famous museum that basically spends their time just identifying insects for people like me. And I said, hey, 
I want you guys, you guys be interested in helping me? I want to do this insect assessment of this grassland site. Why do you want to do that? Well, I want to, I want to restore it and I want to use the insects as one of our metrics or one of our performance metrics. And so this was lifted directly from an email that the person sent back to me. So what he said was, your inquiry is naive at best. If you really want to do this, meaning sample the insects that are in this grassland area, you need 20 years and expansive funding. And he goes on to say, do you have that? And I wrote back and said, no. And then he goes, then you shouldn't even try this. So that's the traditional research university-based model, right? Give me a bunch of, give me a couple million dollars and I'll spend 20 years and I'll find you the answer. Probably a kick butt answer, probably fantastic insight, great detail. We do not have that, or rarely if ever do we have that these days, especially in restoration. So what I would suggest for you is when you guys are working on a project and you're trying to figure out what to do, we want robust, you know, good indicators, but we do not, I don't know if we ever did, but we certainly don't have now the luxury of waiting 20 years to study our salt marsh and figure out what's there. Climate change is going to take these places away before then, long before then. We should absolutely try for lots of funding. Not a great probability of us getting it. Our friends in the Cook Islands and Eastern Africa and places like that, there's an excellent chance there is exactly zero funding that they can get, right? So we need to talk about things that are more cost effective, still robust, still telling us about the ecological functioning, but are robust. So our approach has been to not do this taxonomically. We do morpho species. We do what, we th what look like different species, and there's problems with that because they're not true species. But we also, the big thing we do is we do it based on size. So we count the number of super tiny small dudes, the number of just small dudes, and, the, and we have size breakdowns for all these, right? And what we've done is we've gone out with nets and we've netted a lot of these insects by hand, killed them, sorry, <laughs> and then weighed them. And so we have fresh weights. So we know that for, say, our wetland sites, when we have a guy that's on average this size, he or she weighs on average this much. So now we can count these guys and through regression, multiply this out and know how much biomass has accumulated on our trap. That's a great indicator. Okay, so we can do that type of an approach. We'll talk about that um, in the future. But those types of approaches are the things that, that are helpful to restoration, right? They get at the dynamics, they get at the goings on, but they don't necessarily require 20 years of study. They're cheap, they're portable. We can deploy these in a lot of different areas. Uh, I always want to, this is out of order, I apologize, but I want to fi just finish up by talking about a new approach to characterization. So traditionally, the, before we get to the restoration, we do this historical discussion and investigation like we just did. Then we talk about some of the conditions, which usually mean us going out and measuring stuff, traditionally for a long time, more intensive, like those seed banks takes weeks and this and that, and, and, and insect traps take a while. A new approach, the newest approach that's become all the rage, I was a doubter. I've been sort of proven wrong, mostly proven wrong. And so what, the, what we refer to these as, they're rapid assessments. In the parlance of those that care about this, known as a tier two um, assessment. Tier one would be the quick and dirty. Tier one is how many wetlands do we have in California? That's you know looking at Google Earth, that kind of thing, right? Very cursory. A tier one is something that just takes, that you don't need to spend any money, you can do from your desk basically. Broad brush overview, virtually no data. Just, you know, do we have a grassland there? Is there a forest there? Is there not a forest that level? Not super helpful. Tier three would be all that stuff we were just discussing. The seed banks, the plant diversity, the insect, all that kind of more traditional ecological monitoring that uh, we'd all love to do. It'd be great if we could do. Take a lot of time, costs a lot of money, right? Need a lot of lab space like we have here at our university. Not everybody has a university to use, right? That kind of stuff. So all good. Tier three is the best, but can't always do that. So tier two is between these tier one and tier three. Tier two costs something, but is relatively cheap. Doesn't cost as much as tier three. 
It can be done over a short period of time, on the order of a few days, typically. It's going to focus on looking at the conspicuous, the easy to see elements of the system. Um, right. The question is, is, though, with these systems is, do they really tell us about something? So we go out there, spend a couple days. Is that really the same as having a graduate student spend four years of her PhD studying all the ins and outs of this? Here, here's the response. So, so the, the tool that we've developed in the last few years to deal with wetlands is called the California Rapid Assessment Methodology. And we, everybody, nobody ever says that. Everybody just calls it CRAM, it's acronym. So CRAM sounds like a general term, but it specifically refers to wetlands, in California at least. Okay, it has, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna do CRAM today, but suffice it to say, it's a rapid assessment tool, and it has several components. And it's like A, B, C, D. Okay, we go look at this. Is this A level, B level, C level? So you have to go to training, you have to be instructed how to do it. But basically it says, this is how we look at the condition of this system. There's questions about hydrology. There's questions about the landscape. There's questions about the plants. So there's elements of all these things, but it's literally just putting it into a category, one, two, three, or four. And then through some numerical additions, you combine them. So let's look at what we get from CRAM. Here are a bunch of our sites that we've monitored. Here's Carpentria Salt Marsh up in Santa Barbara, Ash Avenue, the restoration adjacent to it, Ormond Beach, bunch of sites in Magoo Lagoon, Malibu Lagoon, etc. So this is going south. This is the, our uh, southernmost site of, of this data set. Um, we actually go down to Orange County, but this set, data set I'm showing you is just the southernmost site, and then Santa Barbara County. And so here, the overall cram is this red score, but it's really comprised of these subcomponents: assessment of the biotic conditions, assessment of the landscape conditions, meaning meaning what are the, how close are we to the ocean, how close are we to the upland water, that kind of stuff. Hydrology, what the hydrological condition is, and then physical condition. So what's the, what's the substrate and stuff like? So have a look. Some of these things, like the blue, which is hydrology, for these sites are kick butt. These are awesome. These are perfect by the CRAM assessment methodology, or by the hydrological questions, right? The physical kind of sucks, right, at these same sites. So the physical is low. So, so we're taking these things and combining them and getting an aggregate score. And what you find is some sites do really well. Carpinteria scored a, a 90 or, or whatever that is, 89 or whatever the heck, you know, very high score. 12th Street, which is one of the, an area behind a bunch of ditches and, and constraints at Magoo, scored a relatively low aggregate score, right? So you can use these rapid assessments to say, hey, I got a million dollars on my budget this year to put towards restoration. Do I want to, or, or, or whatever it is, do I want to put it into this site? Well, that site seems like it's doing kind of kick butt. Maybe I do. Maybe I want to make, drive it to 100%. Or I could put it down into this site, which has crappy functioning apparently, and maybe that's more bang for my buck. So the rapid assessment methodologies were originally developed to prioritize sites to see which one's the best, which one's the worst, and then help with decision making, right? Originally created not by science, well, they were scientists, but I mean, but, um, but, but the motivation wasn't science, the motivation was management. We need to know a quick answer. We cannot afford to wait 10 years. We need to make a budget decision in the next couple months. Let's do that. Here's how we can use CRAM or anything else for that matter, insects, whatever, in our planning process. So we go out and we sample the site, and we go out and we sample our reference sites. Um, so here's that overall score, Z, you know, low to high. And just because of the, the weirdness of how they made the math for this, even if you had a parking lot, it wouldn't score any lower than I think it's 26 or whatever it is, just because of the math. So it doesn't technically range from 0 to 100. It ranges from the high 20s to 100, but that's just an artifact of how they do the construction. So what we can do is we can just toss up all of our sites. And sometimes you're lucky. Sometimes there's a natural clumping of some sites around this level. Some are this level. 
some are this level. So we could use this before we start the restoration, this pre-restoration data from our site and other sites to, to tell us what would be the target, what would be the goal of the restoration. Hey, perhaps we consider it well functioning if we got it to 80, right? 80 units and whatever, it doesn't even matter what these units are, just this level, right? And if we got below, I don't know, say 50, maybe that's considered a failure. That's considered a degraded system. We could also use this to say, dude, we're not going to snap our fingers. It's not just add water and instant wetland, right? It's not, <laughs> you don't always build it and it doesn't always come. So instead, uh, maybe it's to say, hey, maybe within the first couple years, we hope to be in this low performing range. And then as we expand, and then as we hope our system to recover, respond, go through succession, all this, then maybe we'd expect this level, but maybe that's a level we'd expect in 10 years or something, right? So by having some of this data that doesn't necessarily cost a lot, doesn't necessarily take years and years to go, and maybe we have a situation like Ventura County. There is no reference wetland for us. Every single coastal salt marsh is tweaked in some way, shape, or form. So it's not the, the traditional conceptual picture of, oh, I burned my forest down, let's go to this other patch of forest. Increasingly in the world that we, are, we have inherited, there is no perfect place. There is no one reference place. However, there might be a place that kicks butt in terms of birds. But maybe it's fish suck. Maybe, maybe the site that has good plants has bad animals or whatever. By using this approach, we could measure a bunch of components in a bunch of sites, and we don't have to use the old approach, which is make it look like site A. Right? We can use the elements of all these sites and use that to create guidance information, use that to create the goals, use that to create the metrics by which we will assess our restoration. Right? So with a little bit of history, a little bit of thinking, we can do all that. So to finish up here, I'll just say that um, I thought this was, land. so one of our grants we got from the EPA, we were doing insects and stuff. The EPA, since they like this, the EPA pushes this, everybody has to do cram. So if you're working in a wetland now and you get a federal grant, they make you do cram. Again, it doesn't take very long. It, once you're trained, it just takes, you know, an hour, a couple hours. But I'm like, oh, God, really? <laughs> Rapid assessment is so lame. I'm so much better. I'm so smarter. I know all about wetlands. I've been in wetlands forever. You made me do this. It sucks. But we did it. And so this is a comparison I did to see if CRAM works as well as our, as our more rigorous ecological, we might call tier three assessments. Short version is it's not the same. So a lot of our data give us much more insight, tell us much more about the functioning. However, However, some things seem to work, seem to correlate fairly well. Here's one of those. So here's some of our salt marshes. Again, Carpinteria up in Santa Barbara, Ash Avenue, which is a restoration up in Santa Barbara, Ormond Beach, Magoo, which we've been talking about today, and then Malibu just south of us. Here's the CRAM score when we went and assessed these areas. Again, this is from a, a brief about you know, 40 minutes or so in the field, relatively quick site visit. Designed to be done at one, one time. You don't have to go back. Here is our insect trapping from the data from the same site. And I haven't talked about this. So this is essentially cups in the mud with some, some antifreeze. And the critters that are crawling insects uh, fall into it and die. And then we take that back and we identify everything, right? We measure stuff. So this is a measure of the, what you might call epigeal or ground associated uh, invertebrate community. Now there's noise around this. And so these ones, that have, these ones that have error bars, we actually had several sites in, just next to each other, so we've, we've combined them. So there's, there's some large errors to be sure, but check it out. The areas that we had the highest measures of our insects, insect productivity, and this is, this is the units here, are the grams of fresh weight of these critters per trap uh, that fell in over the course of five days. Um, so high productivity means so if we have lots of productivity, that means the, the, the marsh is supporting a large insect community, right? And then we have some sites like Carpinteria that have very low insect productivity, right? And generally, 
that's a that's a pretty damn significant relationship. That might look ugly to you, but for a lot of our ecological data, that's that's this is statistically significant. This p value is much lower than 0.05. And so that's saying that all of that work that we did, days and days of trapping, multiple return trips, all kinds of student hours in the lab, processing, 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 months and months and months, told us at least in this context, the same story that as we got when we went and did you know a, a, a 45 minute site visit. So that's cool. Again, that's not to say we should never do the insect productivity. I would say we should do that too. But if we're constrained with money and time, we can do that. Also, can I do my insect productivity every single site up and down the California coast? No way. Or well, the answer is yes. Just give me lots and lots of money. But the reality is probably not, right? Whereas cram, we can have people going up and down the coast. To do the stuff that we do, you have to have lots of insect training. You have to have an invert zoo class probably or work in our lab for six months. That, that's, a, that's a high cost. Joe Blow, wetland manager up in the north coast, can't do that. But we can bring Joe Blow to a two-day workshop, teach her how to, or him or her how to do this cram assessment. They can do it. So the, the cheapness also means we have greater representation. So it might not be quite, as, be quite as precise as our more detailed stuff, but we can gain massive amounts of more data. And in that additional data, we actually have a stronger assessment. Because even though each, each single measurement is maybe not as precise as the ones we might otherwise do, the absolute gross quantity of, of data and sites and replicates over time is gonna pr most likely swamp that out and, and, and take care of that and be actually much better. Okay, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll stop there for, for, uh, for this week, okay?